Florida Republican Ted Yoho is back with us via Zoom. He's the top Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee with responsibility for Asia and the Pacific region. And Congressman, it's been a, a week of fast moving events when it comes to Hong Kong. Can you just walk us through what, hap what has happened there this week, week and what it means for the future of U.S. relations with China? Sure, John. I'm, uh, this is a great topic, and this is something that all of the world needs to pay attention. Um, what you're seeing going on in Hong Kong today is an extension of what happened back in uh, the summer of last year when Kerry Lam in Beijing introduced the extradition law that overrode the, the autonomy of the judicial system in Hong Kong that started the initial protests in Hong Kong. You had 25% of that population, over 2 million people coming out protesting uh, the heavy hand of Beijing because they saw what was coming. Um, and it was autonomous rule by the Communist Party. And they protested all year long. Uh, the pandemic came out, things calmed down. But um, China, just with their legislative body, went ahead and opened it, um, uh, put more uh, forcible laws on Hong Kong, and they're gonna strip them of all autonomy. And uh, the people over there uh, are letting them know that it's not acceptable. And what should the U.S. do to uh, let China know its feelings on this? What are you expecting from the president? He's talked about uh, action being announced today from the White House. Well, I think two things that you need to look at. One is the U.S. response, but it can't be the U.S. alone. This agreement was between Great Britain and China, and it was forged in 1992, implemented in 1997. And the agreement was for 50 years, a self-ruling autonomous nation or province of China. There's no doubt it's part of China. But it was an agreement made between the Communist Party of China and Great Britain that Xi Jinping and the Communist Party of today, after 23 years, have overstepped. And as far as Xi Jinping said, he said, as far as he's concerned, this contract is null and void, and they are going to take this over. So the response should be the United States, and you're going to see that today. In fact, Brad Sherman and I, Brad's a Democrat out of uh, uh, California, we have a, a bill putting in tougher sanctions on the people that are involved in this, um, along with the Uyghurs in China. But then the UK and uh, other Western democracies need to stand up. Um, Hong Kong has been known as one of the freest areas on the planet. If you look at Freedom Index score, they have the, the longest life expectancy, the ease of business, one of the highest per capita incomes in the world. That was prior to what China is doing. China is going to uh, kill that, and it is going to hurt not just the Hong Kong uh, economy. It's going to be detrimental to the economy of China, and they're going to find this out. If Hong Kong loses the, the one country, uh, two <laughs> systems, a system that, that's been in place there, what does that mean for other uh, areas uh, with, with tensions in the region, I'm thinking specifically sure. Taiwan, which, which China yeah. has, has claimed as its, as its own. We've got a good editorial that's coming out that talks about this. Um, when China originally agreed with the, the agreement, um, the Sino-Britain agreement, to cede uh, uh, Hong Kong back to China, it was a 50-year autonomy rule. The heavy hand of the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping cannot be honored or trusted, and it's gonna bring shame on the Chinese people. The next step is Taiwan, and China is gonna focus on them and try reunification of China. There's a big difference. Hong Kong is a province of China. There is no doubt about that. Taiwan is not. Taiwan is an independent nation that needs to be recognized, and uh, we've got legislation going in to ask for full diplomatic relations with Taiwan, and this is why. They have a sovereign border. They have their own military, their own economy, their own form of government. And they have their own flag, national anthem. And the other thing is, if you pull the people of Taiwan, they view themselves as Taiwanese and not Chinese. They have never been part of the PRC, the People's Republic of China. Um, they are the Republic of China, but they have never been part of the PRC, which is a communist organization, nor shall they. How willing do you think President Trump is to take that step uh, and to, to get tougher on, on Xi Jinping than he has already? I think you'll see President Trump honor and follow the outline that President Reagan said um, in the last uh, communique where they said that we will uh, allow Taiwan to purchase weapons for self-defense 
And I think you're going to see not just the United States, but I think you're going to see Western democracies around the world come up to uh, shore up the defense of Taiwan. And if we don't do it today, John, is it going to be possible to do it two to three years from now when China has a stronger economy and a stronger military? This is something that China needs to know in the uh, Communist Party and Xi Jinping hands off of Taiwan. It is not acceptable. Talking with Congressman Ted Yoho this morning, uh, a senior member of the Foreign Relations Committee in the House, uh, joining us from Florida via Zoom. If you want to join the conversation, phone line split up as usual. It's 202-748-8000 for Democrats, 202-748-8001 for Republicans, 202-748-8002 for Independents. Uh, Congressman Yoho, as folks are calling in, and you have plenty of calls calling in already for you, sir. Uh, the response the U.S. should have outside of this, uh, the situation involving Hong Kong when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic and how much responsibility the United States uh, should put on China for the pandemic and, and what they should be asking China for. Well, you know, pandemics are going to happen. Uh, they've happened in the past. They're going to happen in the future. Uh, the thing that we can fault China for is the first case was traced back to November of 2019. Uh, December, it was becoming very evident that they had a problem. They suppressed that evidence. They suppressed the word getting out. They didn't share information on a timely basis. And they allowed over 5 million people to leave the Wuhan area. That in itself contaminated the rest of the world very rapidly. They should be held accountable on that. But the secrecy that they have gone on and the way that the WHO, um, uh, Secretary Tedros, of the WHO, the way he placated China and says they're doing a great job, they've contained this, didn't call it a pandemic for two weeks uh, when he should have. Um, those are the types of things that China needs to be held accountable for. And uh, I think you're gonna see that happen uh, in several different ways. One is it's very evident that the supply chain, not just with the United States being dependent on China, but a large portion of the world especially when you come down looking at the APIs, which are the active pharmaceutical ingredients in the medicines um, that everybody takes, 80% of those come directly from China. And that's something that has been a wake up call in the PPEs. I think what you're gonna see, I don't think, I know you're gonna see a rapid switch of APIs or the supply chains on so many things that China is producing that their economy is dependent on you're gonna see them to go to trusted allies. In fact, we wrote a policy paper, it's called Manufacture the ABC Method, and that's manufacture anywhere but China. Because anytime you buy a product from China, it's empowering their economy and it's empowering their military. And to understand what China is trying to do, you need to read Michael Pillsbury's book, um, The 100 Year Marathon. Their goal is to be the lone superpower of the world. And if you want to talk foreign relations, Congressman Ted Yoho, a good person to do that with. Taking your calls this morning, Gary's up first, a Republican out of Newport, Kentucky. Gary, good morning. Morning. Uh, good morning, morning Representative. Um, morning. I just want to say, you know, it's just a whole bunch of crap about this. Uh, it's always Trump's fault, this fault. They never want to go back to China. And that's exactly where it started. And I think Trump did everything, everything that he could do as quick as he could do it. But he's only as good as the information he gets. So it all goes back to China. And I want to I wanted to see what the representative thinks about uh, how immigration, how Trump acted on immigration that did so much to slow this thing down. Thank you. Congressman. Gary, I appreciate, I appreciate your question. I think, you know, there's people that are going to fault Donald Trump regardless of what he does or has done. What they can't fault him on is what he has done with China. This is a, a situation that through neglect, ignorance, or dereliction of duty over the last 40 to 50 years has risen to the level it is now. Donald Trump is the only president that has taken China head on. And I am glad he is at the helm because what he is doing is exactly what needs to be done. They need to be called to task. You know, when you understand what China has done, they've cornered the market on rare earth metals, the vitamins and minerals that go into our animal feed and livestock feed come 100% from China. 
even the trace elements that go into our fertilizers for our farm products, 100% from China. Their goal, like I said, is to take over the world. They're building five aircraft carriers. Um, and um, President Trump is the only one that has woken up uh, the rest of the world on this. And they're finally starting to see that we have to pivot from China. And that's why it's so important when you buy a product, it's going to be hard, but you can find them. Buy product from anywhere but China, Taiwan, Vietnam, uh, anywhere. And if we do that, the economic um, engine that um, keeps China going in the direction they are going, uh, they'll have to rethink what they want to do. And we don't want a conflict. We just want to participate, be a, you know, a peaceful nation. When you talk about what the Trump administration has done, can you explain the action that uh, the administration took when it came to students studying in America who have ties back to uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party and military. Okay, uh, before I do that, I, I need to answer Gary's last question. Sure. His, uh, his ban on the travel and blocking people from coming in was what needed to be done, and it needed to be done sooner, um, but I'm glad he did what he did. Actually, he did it pretty quick. Um, as far as the students, um, a third of the foreign students in, in the United States of America come from China. That in itself is, is okay. The problem is they are indebted to the Chinese government. They have social monitoring scores here in the United States. They have people that are loyal to the Communist Party that are reporting on students that don't follow the Communist Party line here in America. And so I think that's a big problem. The other thing is China has got what they call the Thousand Talents Program where they're paying students to spy on research and development. They're paying our professors, as you've seen with too many of the professors, uh, the one from Harvard, uh, which is a big black mark on the Harvard institution. Um, and so President Trump, and I think what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a rollback of these visas to where there's not so many Chinese students coming over here and they'll be closely monitored in the programs they are and they may be limited into the engineering programs that they so desperately want. Highland Park, New Jersey. This is Jim, a Democrat. Good morning. Good morning to you, and thank you for taking my uh, my phone call. Uh, I, I am going to take this uh, 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 this situation in another direction, if I may. Sure. Uh, I uh, I believe, I firmly believe, and I hope that. The world community, that is the United Nations and all of the countries uh, that comprise the UN, would uh, take this issue seriously concerning China and expel them from the UN Security Council and reinstate Taiwan, who was one of the original members of the uh, U.N. Security Council, reinstate them on the U.N. Security Council. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, the, uh, the U.N. could expel China altogether from the United Nations. Jim, that's music to my ears. I mean, you are so right about that. Uh, if you go back to when the sanctions were put on North Korea, the, there's uh, six permanent members of the UN Security Council. There's 15 members altogether. All 15 members voted unanimously to put sanctions on North Korea for the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Do you know who the biggest um, uh, uh, breakers of that sanctions are? It's China and Russia. The UN has no uh, policing authority, no way to hold a member accountable and I think your point is exactly what needs to be happened. Um, if, if, the, if the members of the Security Council don't follow through on their commitment, they don't need to be on the Security Council. And this is something we've talked to with Secretary Pompeo, the other parts of the State Department with the administration, and we've talked with the UN on this. Um, they need to be held accountable. If not, they're not working to create a peaceful world. They're creating a world that's favorable to China, and this is not helping anybody. Thank you for that comment. Bobby on Twitter with a question for you. What authority has the U.S. to dictate China's relationship with Taiwan and Hong Kong? What other nations would go along with sanctions on China? Uh, it's not dictating uh, what the relationship is. They're free to have any relationship. The problem is when you have a country like China 
that is forcing other countries to break diplomatic ties with China or with Taiwan, I have a problem with that. That You talk about bullying. Uh, they go around the world giving money to these uh, despot uh, dictators or these weak economy countries. And they said, if you break the ties with Taiwan, Taiwan's a country of 23 million people. They're a Western democracy. And there's an agreement that was made uh, under President Reagan that they are going to be, well, we're going to honor the so-called one country, two system, which is a fallacy. That was a, sm- a mistake under Jimmy Carter administration. But there was never this so-called consensus on a one country, two system that came out in 92. And um, at that meeting between the people of Taiwan and China, um, there was a meeting. There's an agreement. There was a meeting and there was an agreement that there was one China, but it differed in the definition of that on the Taiwanese side and on the Chinese side. And so we're just trying to get China to follow through on commitment and not take over a sovereign nation that should stand on their own. And, uh, you know, I think that's something the whole world should be involved in because, you know, what's at stake here is a Western democracy. That's our 11th largest trading partner. And, you know, we've got such a strong Taiwanese um, diaspora in America. And keep in mind that President Tsai, who just got reelected, had the largest election victory ever in the history of Taiwan. And it was on a pro-Taiwanese platform. And the people of Taiwan want nothing to do with China as far as the Communist Party. They identify as Taiwanese, not Chinese. And Chinese is trying to rewrite history as they've done so many times. And it shouldn't be tolerated by anybody. Down to Texas. This is Alex, a Republican. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have a few commentary and then a question. So the United States should improve relations and collaboration with Taiwan to counteract Chinese influence on the global economy. They should also speak with the Taiwanese government to ask if they are receiving threatening commentary from China, like the U.S. has received about the new Cold War so that we can send military support for Taiwan. The United States should also hold Americans accountable who demonstrate support for China with the audio, video, media, and elsewhere in public forums. If communism influences is thought that it strikes in the United States, it can spread faster than this virus. I also wanted to ask Representative Yoho, is the House working on anything to counteract communist influence in the United States? Uh, there's all kinds of stuff going on on that, Alex. You bring up a good point. Uh, there's that glass, uh, auto glass company up in Dayton, Ohio. That was uh, a failed company. It was bought by a Chinese entity. What people need to understand, and I would have, I would have all of the, your listeners here, uh, um, John, to look at that documentary that President Obama put out, and I think it's on Netflix if I can promote something, and it's called American Factory. This is exactly what's going on all over America. This Chinese person comes here, buys a factory. Everybody thinks, oh, he's just a wealthy Chinese person. What they don't understand is that person would not be allowed to come into this country without the blessings of the Chinese Communist Party. On his board of directors, and he is a member of the Chinese Communist Party, His management team, after they got rid of the American management team, are all Communist Party members. And they're doing this around the country. And this is something that it's like a Trojan horse coming in here. It needs to be stopped. And we need to prevent these companies from coming in. You brought up another good point. If you look at the the agriculture sector of America, China has bought the largest pork producer in America. And they control a a processing plant at Smithfield uh, Pork. And this is something that's detrimental to our national food security. And I think we need to look at that. Uh, You're spot on on Taiwan. The rest of the world needs to open up diplomatic relationships with Taiwan if they see the reason to do that. Myself, uh, we're calling for full diplomatic relationships with Taiwan and not hiding under this vagueness of a one country, two system. That is, it's a fallacy and it's something that's eroding and you're gonna see an independent Taiwan and I look forward to standing with those. Are we allowed to sell Taiwan weapons right now? Yes, uh, they have to be defensive weapons. And President Trump just had an agreement, I think it was $10 billion worth. And, um, you know, one of the things that China is scared to death of is our THAAD system. And I've recommended that. And in fact, I told that to one of the defense ministers from Taiwan or from China that if you keep this aggression and keep in mind what they're doing in the South China Sea, they've militarized that. They're going around the world militarizing bases in foreign countries, even though they say they not, we know they are. And, um, you know, when I brought up 
uh, Taiwan, their encroachment in the South China Sea. I told them, I think it's time that we sell Taiwan the THAAD system. And uh, it was a very violent reaction he had. But it's something that tells me that they understand that we're not playing around with this and they need to find a way diplomatically to be inclusive of Taiwan, not to take them over. Less than 10 minutes left with Congressman Ted Yoho. This is Annette out of Albany, New York, a Democrat. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Go ahead. You're on with Congressman Yoho. My name is Annette, and I'm from Albany, New York. And I'd like to ask the representatives, the Republican representatives, uh, why are they delaying funds for us? Why are they letting us starve? And you can sit on TV and talk all of this stuff, but we're starving out here. People are getting evicted. You understand? From, from their home. People are getting their lives destroyed. And we sitting up here talking about some uh, other countries. And I heard it didn't even come from China. Why are people buying about this disease, where it came from, and why we can't get nobody to give us no help. But Annette, got your point. Congressman Yoho on the, the next uh, coronavirus response legislation. Annette, um, you know, I'm sorry for your condition. You need to look at your state and local representatives. You need to look at your U.S. representatives because they're the ones that should be taking care of you and making sure the people in your district are being taken care of. Nobody in America should be starving. We put so much money into our food programs and our social programs, our re-education programs, that it's unacceptable for anybody to be that way in America. And if you've got representatives that aren't helping you, fire them in the next election. As far as the virus, the virus did originate in China. It doesn't, I don't know what you're listening to, but we know firsthand it came out of the Wuhan province in a supposedly fish market or a fresh market. And uh, it's just kind of a coincidence that their most advanced biotech uh, research lab is within about four miles from there. There's no doubt this came from uh, China. What we need to do is un find out why China allowed five million people to leave an infected area and go around the world. Um, and uh, that's what needs to be looked at. Can you talk a little bit about uh, a recent uh, op-ed you wrote, I believe it was the Hill newspaper, about uh, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine oh, yeah. and, uh, and what you're seeing there and, and what the government could be studying from that vaccine? Well, I appreciate you bringing that up because this is research that was brought up to me by Larry Tilley and some other researchers. Dr. Larry Tilley is one of the most respected veterinarian researchers in the, in the world. He's, he's world renowned. He came across, they wanted to know why certain populations were being infected, why were old people more affected than the younger population, why uh, females um, had less infection rate and death rates than the males. And their, their research brought them across a pivot point where there was a group about 50 years of age and above had more morbidity and mortality at that point and below it was less. And the interesting thing they found out is in 1971 to 78, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines were starting, starting to be given on a massive uh, scale around the world. They only attained one vaccine, but from 79 forward, they got two vaccines. And so what they were seeing, and they, they came across a Cambridge uh, study, University of Cambridge, and they found that there's a 30% identical DNA, 29%, identical DNA in the protein structures of coronavirus and rubella virus. And the thought is maybe there's some cross reactivity in protection. And if so, this research can be validated very quickly. And if so, if this is true, can you imagine with millions of doses of MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines readily available, if this will lessen the severity of the disease or prevent people from going into the hospital, and decrease the death rates, would that not be a smart thing to follow up on while we're trying to get a coronavirus vaccine that'll be six months to a year and a half away from now? I think that's something, and we've talked to the administration about, and I know they're looking into this, but if the facts come out and verify the research, this would be something that we could start lessening the severity of the disease and keep people out of the hospitals and uh, have less death rates if it's, if it's true. Time for just one or two more calls. This is Melvin out of Asheville, North Carolina, an independent. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, wanted to sh share the idea that Trump, being the president of the United States of America, 
push the idea of operating in a negative spirit, push the idea that the virus came out of China, and if it, even if it did come out of China, they, are, they frightened the Chinese to make a statement that uh, it did not come from them instead of owning up to the idea it frightened them because of the negativity that Trump was putting out there against the Chinese. So they couldn't accept the fact that they put it out there. So it makes it very difficult for them to accept the accept the uh, idea that it came out of China, and they wouldn't put it out there in such a way that... That's Melvin in North Carolina. Did you want to follow up on that, Congressman? Melvin, I appreciate you weighing in on this. Uh, the facts are it came out of China. I mean, it, there's no question if you go to the World Health Organization, if you go to the different CDCs, not just in our country, but countries around the world, there's no question where this came out. China tried to pivot because of the negativity, and this was before President Trump, you know, came down on China about this. They started blaming the U.S. Army for infiltrating and taking that virus over there, and uh, there's, there's just no way we would do that. And uh, this is something again, China is trying to pivot. But you need to go back and look at the history of China of what they've been doing, uh, very systematically. Their goal is to be the number one superpower. Uh, economically and military, and they want, uh, they're giving people an option of Western democracies or Chinese socialism with Chinese characteristics, which is communism in an Orwellian type of society where they control their people. Uh, you know, if you walk across the street and jaywalk, you get a bad score and it affects you. So people are going to have a choice. Do you want to live like Chinese or do you want to live in a free society? And we've got a lot of work to do. I mean, we, we're not perfect by any means. Last call for you, Congressman. Allen has been waiting. East Chicago in Indiana. Democrat, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. And uh, thank you for the Washington Journal. Love you big time, uh, watcher. Uh, I just want to make two quick points, and I can let you go. Uh, one, I think the coronavirus has uh, shown how dependent we are on China. But i like to say, I think China never didn't steal that much from us. We had American businessmen that willingly and happily relocated in China to increase their profits and looking for cheaper labor. And China built up the factories and gave the equipment. They just turned over intellectual property and had stuff made there. You had companies in the United States that only wanted products made for China because they knew they were cheap. They could charge the same, but labor was cheap. They got a huge profit. So that's going to be a profit there. I think most of our uh, consumer goods, as we found out, we can get masks or gowns, I think, they're coming from China. Alan, thanks for the call. Congressman, wanted to give you time to respond. Alan, thank you. Um, the coronavirus has shown how dependent we are on the supply chain coming out of China. The second point you made, our manufacturers went to the most communist country on the planet to get products made because their tax structure and regulations treated them better than the United States government. We changed that with the American Tax Cut and Jobs Act uh, that President Trump signed into law, and that allowed these companies to come back. And I have met with a lot of these AmCham companies from China, from the Asia Pacific area. They have prostituted themselves out for cheap labor in the name of profits. And they're getting their rear ends handed to them because what they have found, and this comes from the, the CEOs of these companies, within five years in China, the Chinese government has copied that product. They're producing a, a knockoff of it. It's cheap and it's no good. It taints their brand and they're out of business. These companies need to wake up and get out of China produce quality products, come back to America and build made in America. And we as consumers can help this by demanding that and stop buying this cheap stuff coming out of China. Thank you. And thank you, Congressman. Do always appreciate your time with us. Uh, come back again uh, as soon as you can. Appreciate it. Take care. Have a wonderful day.